Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, today, we're gonna go over Twitter, look at some information there. I'll give you my financial opinions around what we're looking at. Uh, it's gonna be stock market and commodity market related. And uh, I'll tie it in to the cycle that we're in, kind of where we're at, because a lot of the information is more or less describing where we're at in the, in the business cycle. So let's dive in, give you my opinions here. We've got, again, if you want to follow me, it's at finding underscore finance. And if you guys need any help with anything, you can obviously reach me at finding-value.com uh, or become a platinum member there. So uh, we've got here, it says the S&P 500 companies are reporting smaller earnings per share surprises for the seventh straight quarter in quarter four. So if you were to think about the stimulus money, if you were to think about all this stuff, the stimulus was basically entered in 2020 and that's where a lot of it came in and we're it's called we're in a late late cycle but we're in the late cycle of the business cycle which means commodities do well energy does well um precious metals start to kick up and i know a lot of people are debating where we are in this cycle money is rotating from both an investment standpoint and a consumer standpoint away from uh, uh, certain companies so it goes towards energy companies towards commodity companies towards uh, real estate and rent <clears throat> and that money is being directed towards that and away from technology away from other things that people may want in their life but maybe not need in their life so what you're going to see in the s p 500 there's a lot of companies that cater to the wants of people not necessarily the needs. And you'll see this kind of decline over time in a late cycle uh, stage. And eventually what you'll see is things will roll over in terms of the housing market. Housing starts will roll over and roll down and it is starting to do that. And I do think it's highly tied to the interest rates. And this is what you're gonna see. You're gonna see earnings surprises go down earnings will go down in general uh, and you'll see the housing starts go down and, and you should see unemployment kick up at some point. And that's all tied to where we are in the business cycle. Uh, it's, Peter Schiff says, it took the Fed until 1986 to get the high inflation rates of the 1970s down to 2%, a benchmark that wasn't achieved again until 1998, 12 years later. The Fed funds rate hit a high of 16.2% in 1986. Today's Fed funds rate is 4.6%. Interest rates still have a long way to rise. Now, what's interesting here, and I've been trying to think about it, <clears throat> do interest rates have to diverge from the housing market? Because interest rates, I would say, you know, if they were to double again, obviously that's going to put us into uh, a recession. I probably would agree with that if you were to double them again. Uh, and the housing starts would definitely decline. But what would cause interest rates to go that high? Is it the inflation already in the system? And how do we, how do we roll that back out? Because we've got M2 money supply that is going down, which makes this a very weird, I'll say, scenario because China's reopening and China reopening is going to put pressure on commodities and energy, the pricing of all that. And if that goes higher, that's really where the consumer price index measures is the price of goods and services and energy and the price of, re of real estate and, and rent. So it is interesting. And, and if the, we'll say the Fed funds rate, if it keeps going up, I do think that will impact the housing market. Now, the housing market is at a very low, I'll say it's not very affordable right now. And it's going to have an impact. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. And we'll see what happens uh, going forward. Now, here's another one that says, do you think the next gold super cycle has begun? What highs will we reach in 2023 and beyond? So this is Stifle. They say uh, gold, the next super cycle has begun. Obviously, everybody's been using this quote, skate to where the puck is going, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, it says, prior and ongoing underinvestment and structurally elevated cost of capital, res 
restricting commodity and gold supply. The supply is going to fall dramatically. Um, and, and I've seen projections where gold is declining rapidly into the 2030s. It says enormous geopolitical shifts as the BRICS economic bloc attempts to wean itself off of the petrodollar system, making gold a centerpiece holding of those central banks. Um, I'm also, I think <clears throat> the United States puts sanctions on certain countries, which also freezes some of their assets, freezes the, the, their bonds and what they're holding in bonds. And I think other people or other countries are looking at this going, I don't want to hold any bonds. Get me out. And then they have to put that money somewhere else. I think that somewhere else is gold. It says structural inflationary debt dynamics leading to continuing waves of inflation fueling increased investment demand for gold and commodities and the inevitable capital rotation out of previously overcapitalized growth sectors within the everything bubble and into undercapitalized value sectors. We believe the next gold super cycle has begun. So that's interesting. Uh, I agree, though. I, I do think gold and precious metals are going to do very well going forward because of a variety of reasons. Um, so this is from Tracy. She says, global oil stocks, crude and products built by 14.3 million barrels last week. Crude stocks built by 9 million barrels with draws in Japan and Europe partially offsetting builds in the U.S. Total oil and crude stocks are well below the five-year uh, five range. Here's our 2023 crude stocks. This is the five-year range. You can see that inventories are very low. At some point, we have to build, I would think, build inventory. Because if we don't build inventory, we're just going to suck it all the way down until prices go much higher. You can't have prices be where they're at if you don't have the inventories. Uh, for forever. So it we'll see where, where we go from here. Uh, I do think that I know there's some refinery maintenance going on. Crack spreads are pretty high right now. So obviously there's that going on and we, we should see builds in, in crude oil. But um, yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now with crude oil and inventories. <clears throat> this was from Jeffrey Snyder. I didn't don't really care what he said here, but I like the China home price index. We can see that there's that cycle going on here. And obviously the cycle's pretty low at this time. <clears throat> it is negative. This is um, a recession in China, given the home price index and what it's doing. Uh, but it does look like it's starting to come back up. If they have a reopening, I'm guessing, and I don't know for a fact, but I'm guessing that home, the home price index could stabilize. But uh, I, I did like this chart though showing you kind of where they are in their real estate cycle. They're in a recovery phase. It says, a market downturn doesn't bother us. Uh, and for us <clears throat> and our long-term investors, it is an opportunity to increase our ownership of great companies with great management at good prices. So that's how he views, Warren Buffett, a recession or a downturn. <clears throat> Everyone else is afraid of it. Uh, Warren, I think, uses it to capitalize on larger stakes in, in the best companies that he could find. Uh, I thought this is a, a good quote here. This is from Peter Lynch. He says, selling your winners and holding your losers is like cutting the flowers and watering the weeds. That's from Berkshire Hathaway's annual letter, originally from Peter Lynch's One Up on Wall Street. And <clears throat> I do talk about this on the website a lot and in a lot of the meetings. I said, you know, one of the strategies that you can have is you you buy into strength, you buy into your winners and trim your losers. Uh, I, I'm actually pretty good at doing that. And I do I don't mind taking if there is a loser or something, I don't mind taking the loss as a as a you know, as taking the loss on it and then rotating it to something that I think that might be stronger. I've got this one. This is the 10 year yield has broken the long term trend line in a log chart. So I've touched the tops here on log, and obviously we've broken out and we're doing a retest where we could see higher 10-year yields or interest rates. Uh, so we're, we could be at the beginning of a rising interest rate environment, even from a logarithmic perspective. And I, this guy says, so commodity super cycle canceled? No, it's 
this is what's causing it. A commodity super cycle is causing is one of the reasons why this why interest rates are going to go higher uh, because it, increasing commodity prices uh, are going to show up in the consumer price index. Um, obviously, the other portion is credit expansion. So there's credit expansion and then the restriction in commodities and the the combination of those two things is going to lead to a commodity or to a um, higher consumer price index and higher interest rates. <clears throat> uh, this one is what's not to like about this potash setup in Brazil, according to Nutrien. It says excess potash inventories gone. Suppliers remain nimble, cautious with respect to uh, to add supply. Everything pointing to big crop season. Soil levels below standard need fertilizers. So fertilizers or potash uh, also could be uh, coming into some strength at some point here. Uh, this is from SRS Rocker Report. It says, why is the energy return on investment of Alberta oil sands so low? The industry reports that Alberta oil has a four to five to one energy return on investment because it consumes one billion cubic feet per day of natural gas for every one million barrels per day of oil sands. Natural gas has an energy content of one sixth of oil. So the, we are transitioning to lower and lower energy return on investment um, oil sources. What that means is that we're getting desperate. And as you shift to more and more uh, lower energy return on investment oil, your production has to increase to cover the low energy return covering the uh, high energy return oil that we're losing. So we're so you, if you want 10 million barrels per day of production growth to uh, you know to offset 10 million barrels of oil production growth of energy return to society, and you're going to replace a 50 to one with a five to one. That means that your production of oil needs to go up 10x, not the same amount. So if you're missing 10, you may have to go up 20 or more because you're, you're not getting the same energy equivalent back to society. So th that's something that you want to, uh, to keep in mind because even if your production goes up, your energy returning to society will go down. If you're replacing these these barrels with high high energy barrels, uh, so this is for uh, gold. It says, is anyone ready for a breakout? It says this is the largest valid bullish rising wedge I have ever seen, and that's with gold coming up into a rising wedge, and hopefully we break to the upside. That also ties in with the gold commodity super cycle. It's all aligning, and the data all lines up. So that's cool there. Uh, here's another one that says, when the shelter component of CPI actually starts declining, I project rent of primary residents to peak at 8.9% in March and OER to peak at 8.2% in April. Uh, the decline will be as slow uh, as the upside though. By December, I project them declining to 6.1 and 5.5. So what this is, is everything in the, in the measurements is quite a bit lagged. <clears throat> And we could still go up with respect to the shelter CPI all the way to about March or April. I've, I've talked about that before on the channel. And then we could see a rollover where things start to slow down from that component in the consumer price index. We do have the grayish line. That's the Zillow 18 month average year over year. That could be declining here uh, around March as well. March is kind of that time frame that I thought we could start to see a decline after that. <clears throat> uh, the 2023 bull case for natural gas, not endorsing this, but it is contrarian and thought provoking to have a $5 target for 2023 nat gas. It says volatility excess on weather, supply flattening to down versus production up year over year, but slowing. Power burn industrial to surprise to the upside. Summer inject to be largely non-record. We do not, we do run a sub case and valuations fine. How did Street have $6 at theirs six weeks ago? 
talking about uh, natural gas. So here's uh, Reuters. Uh, China is expected to import a record amount of crude oil in 2023 due to the increased demand for fuel as people travel more following the dismantling of COVID-19 controls as a result of new refineries coming on stream, analysts said. Sounds familiar. Got oil? And that's China set record for crude oil imports in 2023. Their reopening is going to increase the demand for a lot of different commodities. Uh, the question now is, with the slowing in the United States and the increasing of China, how is that dynamic going to play out and what is that going to do to prices? I don't think anyone knows that answer. Everybody wants to know it, but I don't think anyone knows the exact answer there. Uh, we've got Bitcoin here. This is a two-year time frame. And I looked at the fractal of this bottom over here. And I said, hey, I think we're going to bottom sometime over here. And here we are bottoming. And I said, like, right in this spot there. And we're starting to come up. And we could see a big run in Bitcoin. That is a possibility. <clears throat> uh, we'd have to look at the larger picture, larger picture view to see, you know, where we are in this cycle. But, you know, Bitcoin can run. And then the question is, why is Bitcoin running? Is it looser monetary conditions? What, what's going on with the why? And I don't have the why for you. I, I mean, I can sit here and guess, but um, I, would, I would think that it's still loose monetary conditions. That's kind of where my brain is at, which makes me think that we are not too tight necessarily. Uh, here's Happy Hawaiian. It says, in the first two weeks of February, used car prices are up another 4.1%. They're barely down from the peak at this point. So this is the, the use value vehicle index, and this is used in the consumer price index from my understand, if I can remember. Big move higher. We, we've come on down, and looks like we're coming back on up. Uh, we're also seeing Bitcoin come up. We're seeing the used vehicle value index go up here. What is going on? It seems like we're having a resurgence of inflation. We're also seeing uh, home home prices going up, and and the uh, inventories go down. They're all interconnected, guys. Uh, prices of all this stuff is more or less just how much money's in the system. And as home prices keep going, I don't know if they're going to continue to go higher. We'll have to watch it. Because it is highly, uh, I'll say, uh, sensitive to interest rates. But everything is going up here in the short term. Bitcoin, the, the value of used vehicles, home prices, et cetera, et cetera. That does mean that there is money sloshing around the system. Uh, this is the global LNG shortage is expected to become more acute over time. So this is the global LNG supply versus demand forecast. The demand forecast is the blue. And there's this gigantic gap coming in liquefied natural gas. So in the short term, yeah, in 2023, we do have a balanced market due to weather. But looking at this from a longer term perspective, the gap is still out there. And I think that's an investment opportunity for the patient investor. I'm looking at this from the long term. That's how I invest. That's just how I do things. And I accumulate companies and, and assets <clears throat> that I think will do well over a 10, 20 year period. And this is one of the areas I'm looking at is global LNG supply, which is the natural gas that's coming and the, and the demand for it. So that's also quite interesting there. Uh, here's one. Uh, it says the next secular commodity bull market is setting up. S&P uh, 500 metals and mining index versus the S&P 500. So this is a ratio of the S&P 1500 metals and mining versus the S&P 500. Secular bear markets here, secular bull markets coming on up, and we have, we're in a secular bull market, and we've got a double bottom with a reversal pattern. This thing rocketing higher here means that we are going into a bull market for metals and mining. We've got the bottoming pattern. It's a big boy pattern too from a very cheap level. This also looks very similar to the producer price index to uh, consumer price index ratio as well. So we're entering the bull market, guys. 
Uh, we've got the reversal pattern and we're heading higher. Just like we thought. This is Antero seems to be arguing that rig count could fall well below 50 in the Haynesville. Haynesville is a shale play down in Louisiana. <clears throat> this is from their latest presentation, uh, their earnings call. And they're saying with the declining natural gas price, it says rig reduction when front month natural gas breaks $3 in MMBTU. We have definitely broken that. And we could see a rig count change go, go down, 42. So that is something we could see. Rigs declining for a little bit. So some of the energy service companies, the drilling companies could go down in the short term uh, and then bottom at some point, maybe summer of 23 or something like that, whenever it is. And I just see that as another buying opportunity for all of these um, areas. The commodity bull market's here, uh, but we're going to see waves of slowdowns as they overproduce, underproduce, or if the weather doesn't match. Uh, the demand doesn't pick up due to weather. Uh, here's rhodium. It says rhodium made a new low at $10,000 an ounce. Expect palladium to go much, much lower. And one thing I was looking at is this is a Livermore accumulation cylinder from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's that hump I always see at the bottom of the accumulation cylinder. And then we had the big run. <clears throat> This is going to happen, this, this area here, this is going to happen, I think, in natural gas. Natural gas is gonna come down, it's gonna create a, a bullish Livermore cylinder in natural gas. We're gonna get this hump soon at some point, maybe this summer or, when, or fall or whatever, and then it's gonna have a big old run when we get cold weather or something like that at some point. <clears throat> so that is something to watch. Um, and I wanted to show you that, that that had the accumulation cylinder as well in the beginning of that run of rhodium. All the way to almost thirty thousand. This is the consumer. The U.S. consumer price index has entered a new phase. So, if you've seen this before, say hello to the consumer price index. You've got a rate of change here, gathering speed, runway, the takeoff, approaching top of the atmosphere, and then this is firing rockets and setting course for the moon. For the uh, consumer price index for all urban consumers. This is all items in the U.S. city average. And we are going vertical here in cost due to where we are in the credit system. Commodities are going to love this. And that's why we're seeing all these setups. All of this information I'm telling you across the board is matching each other. <clears throat> Here's energy stocks look very cheap measured by free cash flow yield. So free cash flow yield, energy stocks have never been cheaper. <clears throat> they are dirt cheap. And if higher prices are coming, it's just going to make this a better investment. So yeah, I think energy stocks are just incredibly cheap. Incredibly cheap, even with natural gas where it's at. This is the U.S. federal debt in the blue and the U.S. federal debt held by foreign and international investors. The question is not, will it get funded? The question is, can it get funded without the Fed help at a rate that won't touch off a U.S. government and global debt doom loop. So what this is, is this is international investors, <clears throat> and this is the issuance of new debt. Um, this debt issuance is tied to the consumer price index that we just looked at. And what's happening is this is going vertical in <clears throat> the total debt being released, and you can see the appetite for foreign and international investors is declining. The gap is getting larger over time. And that gap, if, if the Federal Reserve doesn't come in and buy this or the Treasury or something like that, you're going to see interest rates continue to, to rocket higher. There's no one wanting to buy the federal debt, and that's a big problem. This will be inflationary as well. Because if they're running deficits, if this has to happen and they're running deficits, which this is basically showing us they are, that's infl inflationary. It is inflationary. Um, <clears throat> nothing's changed from URA, the front. Uh, we are still scribing out the, the accumulation cylinder. And we've broken to the upside, and we're going to continue on higher for URA, which is uranium, given past cycles and, and the, uh, the fractals that were put out. 
Here's gold versus the SPY, and obviously we've broken out of that. Um, nice little pattern here. We've broken to the upside, doing a back test, and then I think we'll head on higher where gold will outperform stocks. Every everything, all guys, everything I show you on all of these, they're all interconnected. They all show us that we're in um, an expansionary phase of real estate, late cycle, and th this is where this all takes off. We've got deficit spending, inflation's coming down the pipeline. We can't we can't fund our our, our, our deficits. We continue to do deficit spending. The investor appetite's lowering for foreign investors. They're buying less U.S. Treasuries, buying more gold because of actions that I think the United States have taken recently. And every single chart I pull up, it all is basically telling us that a commodity bull market's coming. Now, what people do wrongly is they look at the short-term market movements and try to correlate a narrative to the short-term market movements. I'm looking at these things from 5, 10-year, 20-year timeframes. And in the short term, things can move all over the place. The underlying structures for a commodity bull market to happen. Now you have to be patient enough for that to play out over the next 10 years. Because in the in the next three months, maybe it goes down and it looks like it's like people will get convinced that it's not moving. But the problem is markets move up and down even in a gigantic bull market. So the things that you're seeing today and the signals that you're reading off of prices in the short term may not match what's happening in the long term. It's just a pullback, like Buffett said, to accumulate cheaper shares of the great companies in a big secular bull market, you're going to have cyclical pullbacks. It's part of the game. You got to learn the game. The game needs, you need to learn what the game is and you need to, you need to be in basically a, a function of whatever the game is. That's how you need to change yourself as an investor. Anyway, guys, that's what I've got for today. Thumb up with the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.